Will the United States impose sanctions on India if our government starts deporting illegal Bangladeshi infiltrators? And Tushar Kalburgi says, how will the U.S. react if the government of Bharat starts to deport all the illegal Bangladeshi infiltrators into present-day East Pakistan? Uh, the illegal... Okay, the first, the first question is... The first point is that we have to recognize the fact that there's a... There's a gigantic number of East Pakistani Bangladeshi infiltrators who are currently who currently exist in India. I think around 2014, the government had said that there are about 50 million Bangladeshis in India, five crore. That's in 2014. And since then, a lot of water has flown under the bridge. So if I were to give a very rough guesstimate, I would say the number must have doubled by now. Okay, maybe a hundred million, ten crore illegal East Pakistani infiltrators in, infiltrators in India who currently would be residing in India. They have this entire industry which, which you know, gives them placements in various parts of India, integrates them with various other Bangladeshi infiltrators who already reside in India, gives them documentation, Aadhaar cards, whatnot. So that industry is entirely in place in Bharat. And they are able to send Bangladeshi infiltrators, Rohingya infiltrators to the far and wide areas of India, including in Jammu and Kashmir. We know that. Now, I would imagine that one of the reasons why the government of India did not take any action about this is that uh, Sheikh Hasidah was in power. And sending, rounding these people up and deporting them to Bangladesh would, would to a large extent, cripple the Bangladeshi economy. We didn't want that to happen. But now that Bangladesh no longer exists, it's East Pakistan, it's, an, it's, it's a hostile nation. Maybe it makes sense to send back these Bangladeshi East Pakistani infiltrators. That would be a long, drawn-out process. A hundred million is no small number. That's a gigantic number. It's bigger than most countries, bigger than the population of most countries. But let's say India does that. It starts the process in Assam or wherever and starts sending uh, 2,000 back every day. Rough, hypothetically, okay, as, as an example. What will happen? Well, First of all, the entire ecosystem within India, the anti-India ecosystem that exists in, within India at various levels and various institutions infiltrated everywhere, they will start a huge hue and cry about this, a huge hue and cry about this. The Indian media, what, whichever is bought over by the anti-India element, they will start a big hue and cry. And that will be the cue for the global media to start howling in protest. And they'll say that India is uh, without reason... Uh, without giving a fair trial or whatever. Uh, India is indulging in human rights abuses and uh, India, India is indulging in, in selective targeting on the basis of religion and whatnot. They, they're going to make all these stories. It's going to, and they will definitely, I guarantee you, they'll succeed in tarnishing the, the reputation and name of India. It's going to be a very successful campaign. The entire Western media world will ecosystem will, will jump on board on this. So you will have various uh, German publications like DW and whatnot. Uh, French publications will, will be on board. All the European publications will be on board. There's, you know, media outlets. Uh, in, in, in the UK, you will have The Guardian, the BBC, who will... Who will devote vast amounts of, of of journalistic real estate to this. And obviously the New York Times, Washington Post, they will create this entire narrative globally. Australian media will be, will be on board and so on. They will come together and combine to create this vast, gigantic, concerted avalanche, this narrative against India that will be very bad for India's reputation. You travel abroad, people will look, you, look at you in a very bad way. That's what they'll do. And that will be just, just be the start. If India still persists, they will they may even impose sanctions upon India. So that's the deal. That's how powerful the ecosystem is. I think we are saddled with these illegal infiltrators for some time to for some time at least. And like I said, right now is may not be the time to deal with the illegal East Pakistanis in India. Obviously, it's a huge threat for India. It's a very powerful asset the Americans have within India. If they want to unleash mayhem, they can using the illegal East Bangla, East Pakistani infiltrators. They can do that. So that's, in a way, it's a ticking, a ticking time bomb, but probably not one you want to defuse right now. Yeah? Uh, because we have bigger problems in the region, like I said, in India's Far East. That is something India will have to deal with on a more priority basis. Probably in alignment with another, with maybe one or two other countries that are kind of in alignment with us, perhaps. 
Okay, TechWise 360 says, Putin has said that NATO will be in direct conflict with Russia if Ukraine uses the Western long-range missiles. Is the situation that bad right now? So what's happened? So since the uh, special military operation began in February 2022, uh, the West, the US, and its uh, various minions, puppets, have been supplying Ukraine with arms, ammunition, and so on, including short-range things, missiles, whatever, even long-range missiles, with the caveat that uh, Ukraine will only use short-range weapon systems and artillery and and whatever uh, across the border with Russia. And whatever long-range missile systems the Ukrainians may have, they will use it only within Ukraine, Ukrainian territory, uh, which in the eyes of Ukraine is currently occupied by Russia. So that's been the deal. Now it looks like the Americans will be okay with giving Ukraine the go-ahead to use wrong, uh, long-range missile systems for cross-border strikes into Russian territory, deep into Russian territory. And I believe that the missile system that's uh, being spoken about right now is the Storm Shadow cruise missile. So this, depending on where you look, what source you look at, this missile system seems to have a range of between 250 kilometers to 550 kilometers, depending where you look, what source you're looking at. So it's a reasonably, I would call it a medium range missile system, but you can say it's no longer tactical and short range. So you can call it a long range missile system. So using this missile system, the Ukrainians could hit deep into Russian territory. Let's take a look at the map and let's see uh, how far they could uh, go. So um, we're talking about Ukraine here. So let's say, so we know that they are in control of Kharkiv. And let's see if you go to Voronezh, it's 250 to 60 kilometers. So they can definitely hit Voronezh. How far is Let's say Moscow from northern Ukraine. Moscow is about 545 kilometers. So it's at the the outer range of the Storm Shadow missile, cruise missile system. So using this cruise missile system or any other cruise missile system, maybe a longer range one, they could hit Moscow and hit deep into Russian territory. So that's a whole different paradigm we're looking at. That's a whole different kind of warfare we're looking at. Thus, Thus far, the Ukrainians, they have not been allowed by NATO, by the West, by the Americans to do this. Now it looks like they will get the go-ahead to do that. But here's the deal. These weapons systems, missile systems, they have to be long-range systems. You have to input coordinates into them. You have to input a flight path into these missile systems so that they know where to fly and what to hit. And only NATO technicians are allowed to do this. So essentially, you will have a missile system, a missile that's going to be fired from Ukrainian territory into Russia, and a NATO technician who will either be American or European, Western European, will go and input the coordinates of the target and the flight path into the missile. So now you have direct NATO involvement. Do you understand the difference? Until now, it was a short-range system that the Ukrainian army was using. Now, the the the, the order to fire may be given by a Ukrainian soldier, general, whatever, the, the button will be pressed, but the inputs will be uh, fed into the system by NATO technicians. At least that is what Putin says. So now, if this happens, it's going to be a whole different kind of warfare, a whole different level of warfare. And Vladimir Putin has spoken about this, and he has said that if NATO allows the Ukrainians to use long-range missiles against Russia, he's going to consider it to that. He's going to consider this to mean that Russia, that NATO is now directly at war with Russia. There is no proxy in between anymore. The proxy was Ukraine. Now it's NATO versus Russia straight away. And he considers that to be a whole different kind of warfare, a whole different escalation. And And he says that Russia will respond appropriately. So we are staring at a significant level of escalation here. Now, how would Russia respond? Russia has all different kinds of ways of responding, a variety of ways in which they could respond. This means that they will no longer target uh, targets. They will no longer, you know, hit out at targets merely within Ukraine. 
they will now be free to hit out at targets in, in target locations that are within NATO nations or assets that belong to NATO nations. One example is they could take out a, a, a potentially a British aircraft carrier using one of their uh, hypersonic missiles, perhaps the, the Zircon missile or whatever. They could do that as a warning. Uh, so we're looking at significant escalation if the West allows the Ukrainians to use long-range missile systems against Russia. Uh, now, what, what should we make of this? The, the Western commentary that comes out from the, the higher echelons of, of the US military and NATO is that Putin is bluffing. And if, if Russia's red lights existed, they have been crossed long ago. That's the kind of commentary that's coming out of the West, of NATO, of the US. Now understand one thing, Putin never bluffs. From the time when he was in charge of a single city until where he has reached now, he has never bluffed. He, may, he makes it a point to remind people, to remind the world that he has never bluffed. His words have meaning. His, his words carry weight. When he says something, he means it and he does it. And the US would like us to believe that, no, nah, no, nah, you know, it's all bluff and there are no red lines and we have already crossed the red lines and the Russians did nothing. So we are looking at two very different versions of what's happening in the world. Two very different narratives. And one of these is correct, one of these is false. So I, I hope that this escalation doesn't happen. I hope the Americans don't give the Ukrainians the go-ahead to use these long-range weapons. Because I, in my estimation, the Russians will, will respond appropriately, like they say. What is appropriate, they is, they're going to decide what appropriate is. But it's not going to be fun. It's going to be a, a big escalation. And then, then the US will use that as, a prete as the pretext to escalate further. And you see what's happening. You're going up very rapidly up the chain of escal escalation. And what's up there at the top? World annihilation. Nuclear exchange. Which is the end of the world. We never want to even consider that. So who's escalating right now? The Americans are escalating. They should step back. They should calm things down. They should de-escalate. But no, they're trying to escalate further. So that's where we are. Very dangerous days we are living through right now. Very dangerous days.